today's reading of A Conflict of Visions. I am joined by my co-host, Alex Maselli, and we are reading Chapter 3 of A Conflict of Visions by Thomas Sowell. And this is Articulated versus Systemic Rationality. Uh, and in this... This is a this is a very interesting thing because Sowell puts his finger on something that has always annoyed me. And that is I can't understand the mind or I before this I could not understand the mindset that believes that everything can be articulated and that can accept that some things are just implicit. To me it comes across as a kind of hubris. You will never run through all of the variables. So demanding that some model exists that accounts for every single contingency is kind of weird. It, it, it seems kind of quixotic to me. Well, I guess quixotic is how you say it. Saying it either way feels wrong. Um, anyway. Uh, but anyway, so there is a... So he puts his finger on this and points out that it depends on your view of rationality. If you think that there is such a thing as distributed rationality, that institute, as he says, institutions and whole societies leads to a general survival of more effective collections of cultural traits in sort of a pseudo-Darwinian fashion, then you will place at least some weight on institutions. You will place at least some weight on tradition. And now that's not to say nothing can change anything. That's not, you know, that's a very extreme version of it. Obviously, this is a sliding scale and there are shades of gray. But the point is, is there, it, there is this idea that just because something has not been fully articulated or seems to be difficult to articulate doesn't mean that there's no reason for it or that there's not even a very good reason for it. And there are certain things, uh, for example, the invisible hand idea in economics that the economy that cannot be planned because it's not something that can be totally uh, subsumed under a concept, that it's not something that can be effectively modeled to the point where you can predict, control, explain, and plan it. And that's where we get ideas like the invisible hand, that the market, there are market forces and mechanisms that just do certain things. Um, and there's a there's a uh, there's a criticism of that that I thought actually kind of smelled like a projection in a way. Uh, and let me let me find the place where that criticism is made. Uh, Ronald Dworkin. Uh, many modern writers on law represent the unconstrained vision much more unambiguously than Mill. For example, Ronald Dworkin dismisses the silly faith that ethics, as well as economics, moves by an invisible hand, so that individual rights and the general good will coalesce, and law based on principle will move the nation to a frictionless utopia where everyone is better off than he was before. Which is projection. This whole thing about how, oh, those, those stupid conservative people are trying to make the world into a utopia. <clears throat> no, they're not. That's someone else. He, he accuses his opponent of utopian thinking because that's how he thinks. Which... When in reality, the idea is not that economics moves by an invisible hand and it's going to move us to a frictionless utopia. It's that the invisible hand is extremely messy and causes all kinds of problems, but it's still better than the alternative. It's, it's that old saw, uh, capitalism is the worst form of, uh, is the worst kind of economy besides all the other ones. That, that old cliche that's variously attributed to a bunch of different famous people and has a few different renditions. It, it's, it's that. That's much closer to the way that uh, libertarians and conservatives think about these things, is that, well, does capitalism suck? Yeah, it blows donkeys, but it blows fewer donkeys than all the alternatives. So if you want to measure the effectiveness of an economic system it, as an inverse proportion to how many donkey dicks it sucks, uh, capitalism wins because it blows the fewest donkeys. My issue with the unconstrained vision, as he described it in this chapter, is it's 
extreme elitism. Like, it's so crazy to me that they have this idea that man is perfectible, and that means all men, and, you know, man is in the general term. And, but at the same time, they think that those who are higher up on the perfectibility scale, as, that that's by their own moral values, essentially, uh, should be in charge of everything. And, and of course, if you adhere to an unconstrained vision, you always think you are one of those people, those gifted people that needs to be at the top and pulling all the levers of society. And it's like, this just sounds like egomania. It doesn't even sound like, um, like and, the, and the idea that it's moral and sincere. It's like, I, I don't think, I think they're justifying, rationalizing their need for control over other people. Uh, yes, and there is a uh, the extension of instrumental rationality into politics. There's a name for it, and I'm going to quote a theorist that actually a lot of people on the right really hate, but I think he's important to read. I'm going to quote Foucault, or not quote him. I'm going to paraphrase him. It's called biopower. Um, I have an article on my Substack, and you can find my Substack in the. There's a link in the description, but I have an article on my Substack uh, uh, about biopower and its use in the um, current. It, well, in a totally hypothetical society where there's a pandemic of Count Choculosis, where, where Count Chocula causes a pandemic, uh, and. And it's an examination of the application of biopower. Now, what biopower is, is basically when we get to a point in history because of medical science, among other things, medical science, psychology, uh, urban planning, sanitation, things like that, where governments, and by extension, large corporations, because American multinationals are not meaningfully separate from the, from the United States government, um, where governments and other similar institutions take an interest in the health of their citizens. So, for example, uh, the medicalization of certain people, the fact that certain political dissidents, both in the United States and in the USSR throughout the 20th century, were frequently diagnosed with schizophrenia as a means of discrediting them. Uh, in the USSR, they had this idea called sluggish schizophrenia, where you could be diagnosed with some with with schizophrenia if you didn't like communism. But but it's sluggish; the symptoms take a while to show up. So we have an excuse to pack you off to the mental hospital because you were showing the symptoms, early symptoms, and now no one will ever hear from you again. Um, and I think they used that on people who were too high profile to just disappear to a gulag. Uh, what else? And then in the United States, uh, you have actually people on the left have this happen to them. Uh, what was her name? Valerie Solanas was a was a radical feminist in the 1970s. She shot Andy Warhol. She published a radical feminist manifesto called the Scum Manifesto. I'm not going to comment on the validity of her views. I'm just going to point out that the, the uh, court-appointed psychiatrist diagnosed her with, take a wild guess, schizophrenia because that was a means of discrediting people. Now, by, that's an extreme example of biopower. Um, but there are others. There, there are more subtle ones. Uh, one good example... Um, well, here, I, I'll give you an example. The fact that if I go to Google right now, and I'll give you the backstory on this. At one point, I was having, I, I was trying to troll somebody online, and he asked me what he had to do to, it was something like, what do I have to do to get you to agree with me? And I said, well, here, let me get you some instructions. And I Googled in, in, on Google Images how to tie a noose. And I was going to send that, oh, just here, do this, and it's instructions on how to tie the noose with, with the implication that he should go hang himself because I'm kind of a prick. Uh, but when I Googled how to tie a noose, um, a warning popped up with a number to the suicide help hotline. That's an example of biopower. It, it's sort of like Google is watching you in case you slip up for your own good. That's uh, that. That's a 
that's another example of biopower. When they're when authorities are taking an interest in your health or your well-being, or and they get to define when you're healthy, that's the important part. You know, the author there are authorities and experts, note that word experts, who are vested with the power to define things. They are vested with control over language. And this is all, of course, ultimately backed up by the fact that the state has a monopoly on violence. Um, but anyways, there are experts who are vested with the ability to define things. So if the experts define health in a certain way, then you are unhealthy and thus a threat to the people around you if you contradict the experts. And you can see this um, in, in a in all these social media initiatives. Oh, well, if you have a friend who you think is radicalized, here's how you can quote unquote help them. And if your friend is quote unquote radicalized, I have to throw air quotes around everything because it's so manipulative. And of course the government and big tech and all these other institutions get to dictate what the definitions of these terms are. And we've seen them, and we've seen them like mess like, with how they define these things, 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 things recently. recently. Um, a lot of people talk about the orientation one uh, when it comes to uh, orientation or preference uh, example of last year. And then there's also um, like what does being someone who doesn't necessarily vaccinate mean or you know the term i mean, i don't want to bring it up in case someone the the algorithm tries to grab us but you know what i mean <laughs> yeah exactly uh, the, the count chocula shot yes <laughs> you're anti count chocula you're uh um you're bad uh and i recently actually this is kind of sad do you remember Last year, right before all the protests kicked off, um, there was a woman filmed in New York uh, in Central Park with her dog by a man who was a bird watcher. Um, and uh, she was screaming and crying on the video, and she ended up getting arrested. And, well, the court appointed her therapy in response. And it turns out, there have been several instances of that man going around and trying to essentially poison people's dogs and film their reactions. So she, in, so her reaction on camera is to a very real threat. But all you oh, see, yes, and the court took part in it. Of course they did. And there was another case of that with a guy who um, went around, he would go up to random middle-aged white women and try to get them to freak out on camera. And when he finally got one to freak out and have a meltdown and, oh my God, don't ruin my life, please, uh, he, within 15 minutes of uploading that video to Twitter, he had t-shirts with like quotes he'd taken from her that he was selling because he was a grifter. He was trying to induce this in people. And Twitter eventually removed uh the video it's pretty horrifying if you've seen it he filmed her license plate and she's like crouched down trying to cover it with her body and screaming hysterically because she's afraid she's going to get lynched um but it, it's it's okay because uh because count chocula got his feelings hurt um that one was rough to watch because she was clearly terrified but and he'd done it before they'd you know there were all these instances where he uploaded previous videos. It was ridiculous. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> but um, one thing that the last two books we've read bring up that really drive me crazy, and, and it's not it, it's not that the, the author of the book is pissing me off, it's just they're bringing up a subject that pisses me off. Earl Warren. <laughs> I hate that guy so damn much, and I get angry every time he's mentioned. So, and I'm like, I feel vindicated when I read that they are describing Earl Warren's policies so, you know, 
ridiculously, but it's just, it's like a trigger for me. I'm like, ah, oh, that bastard. <laughs> who is, he? who is he? Earl Warren is the judge who decided the Miranda v. Arizona case that resulted in Miranda going free from confessing to raping a young woman. And after he was let go, because they hadn't read him his rights, so he shouldn't have been able to confess or whatever, uh, he raped another woman. <laughs> So, and, and that's when, that was the period when, um, I think there was sudden, there was more upsurge, a groundswell, essentially, of victims' rights advocacy, because that's ridiculous. <laughs> so, to circle back around to the text here. Um, we have, these different visions applied to the law lead to opposite conclusions regarding judicial activism. The unconstrained vision, as applied by Dworkin, calls for an activist court to read its own meanings into the words of the Constitution. In this, he is by no means alone, either in his conclusions or in the methods used to reach them. His call for a fusion of constitutional law and moral theory for fresh moral insight has been one among many. Oliver Wendell Holmes' conception of the law left no such room for judicial activism. It is dangerous to tie down legislatures too closely by judicial constructions, not necessarily arising from the words of the Constitution. Nor was it merely the words, but rather the original meanings of those words that were to be adhered to. He refused to declare unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment methods of taxation which were well known when that amendment was adopted. He later spoke of the more than anxiety that I feel at the ever-increasing scope given to the 14th Amendment. In yet another case, he saw no reason for reading into the Sherman Act more than we find there. So he's an originalist, is I believe what that's called. And I, that's something that happens a lot on the left is the uh, legislating from the bench. That's what they call it. And it's like, that's the whole point of having three branches of government is that the judges are not creating law. And, but this is basically saying, do that. And then if they can't do that, they want to pack the court. Uh, because the, the fact of the matter is, is that when you look closely at leftist politics, at no point is it ever about what they say it's about. The justification for packing the court supposedly was uh, because, oh, well, because Trump appointed somebody just before he left, so we have to pack the court. Really, it's just about power. Um, wanting to make a new state, supposedly, is because Puerto Rico desperately needs statehood, even though they don't seem to want it. Uh, but in reality, it's because of the hope that they'll vote left. It's about power. Every single thing that the left does, it, it appears, it always has this silly moral justification on top of it. But when you look closely at it, it's just about power. And they never do anything else, really. I'd say that includes statehood for DC as well. That's another one I like to bring up. Um, and yeah, it's just about swaying things to their side, which is actually kind of... Uh, when they lost a house seat in California because their um, population went down. Uh, it was kind of hilarious, them getting so mad about it because they lost a seat. And it's like, because uh, you know they just want more power. That's what all of this is about. And I would rather have the two more balanced uh, because Either way, I think one side, when it gets too much control, is going to fuck everything up. <laughs> oh, indeed. Um, I think that the current foreign policy failure in Afghanistan is going to be... Uh, it's going to be interesting how that plays out. Nobody's going to care in two weeks, but as soon as the elections come up, both the 2022 midterms and the 2024 presidential, in both cases, the Republicans are going to dredge up Afghanistan and start screaming about it. And I think it's probably going to work. Uh, the 
CNN actually stopped cheerleading for Biden for a few days over that, which is incredible. That's like that, that's like getting Fidel Castro to stop liking communism. It's it's I, I don't know what amount of cognitive distance it took to cause that to happen. Um, I would say that to some extent it took ratings. <laughs> Because a lot of the motivating factor behind media is ratings, and their ratings took such a huge hit after Trump was um, no longer president, and there's nothing to report on, especially since he was kicked off social media, because you can't even like look at his what he's saying on social media and talk about it. So his influence is so much less than it was, you can't report on it. So I think to some extent, they they wanted that bump in ratings. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely a motivating factor. Um, it's probably a bigger one than ideology, although I think they probably believe that their ideology is what's going to keep them uh, situated. And I think that that's why sinecures tend to be ideologues, uh, people who hold some bureaucratic or effectively bureaucratic post. I mean, large private companies at this point are so... Uh, close to the United States government, they might as well be appendages thereof. Um, but one reason sinecures are so often ideologues is because the bureaucracies of which they are a part were created by an ideology, so they have to believe in a particular ideology in order to keep their job. And when someone needs to believe something in order to keep their job, uh, they start to actually believe it, not just pay lip service. I think we're both trying to read the chat. <laughs> we were. I am... I really don't like the, 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 he goes on, you, you mentioned this, like, oh, you have to believe it, and he mentions sincerity versus fidelity, um, and, uh, the sincerity thing kind of made me laugh, because I'm like, how many of these people are truly sincere? I don't, I, I don't think, if they are sincere, they're deluded. That's my thought. Because it's just, it's stupid. <laughs> well, keep in mind, if everyone around you has the same opinion and you are never exposed to the other side except as this sort of abstract boogeyman that you never meet face to face, you'll believe what you're told. Um, progressives are people, by and large, who have never met or have never had a serious discussion with a conservative. Uh, they are probably vague, unaware that conservative people really exist outside of their televisions and computer screens. You know, th these are people for whom middle America is this vast, dark forest full of racist people who are going to come kill them or whatever. And you have to think that progressives embrace a series of views that are ludicrous, but they really believe them. Um, for example, this idea that fascism is on the verge of taking over the country. This idea that there are hordes and hordes of far-right, like, Nazi fascists who are going to come overtake the United States government. They really think that's going to happen. They, honest to God, believe that. Is that absurd? Yeah, it's absurd. That It's not true. There is no significant or politically viable far-right movement in the United States, but they believe there is because they're constantly told that. I can't imagine how, like, you see videos of these people freaking out sometimes when someone is just not following the weird, um, bullshit. And, even, and you see them freaking out online, you see them freaking out in public, and it's kind of like, you're in psychological pain. Like, because right at this moment, your reality is being, you know, broken a little bit. And that's the problem with a fake, you know, view of the world, is that it could destroy you. 
Mm, yeah. Uh, what, what is that thing I say like a million times? You can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. Uh, and it's true. I can choose to ignore the cars on the highway, but if I try to walk across the highway and ignore the cars, I can't ignore it when one of them turns me into high-speed pasta sauce. Uh, so you can ignore reality, but the consequences of doing so cannot be ignored. And th th this is one thing that we see with the left. And it's not really, I would like to, I would really like, I'm really tempted to say, oh, yes, it's because they're inherently inferior. They can't sense reality, but it's not true. The reason that the left is so blinkered that they cannot, uh, that th th there are certain realities that they just can't uh, apprehend no matter how much they're confronted with it is that they have institutional power. All of the major institutions of the United States are overtaken by progressive liberalism, although they think they seem to think that they're like rebels who are dissenting against the status quo, which I think is hilarious. But anyways, all they have total control of all of the important institutions. And because of that, they can afford to ignore reality for now. The problem is, is that sort of the, the, the so to speak, the the capital that lets them do that all all of the accumulated power that cushions them so that they are insulated from the consequences of ignoring reality is going to be burned up until they finally are faced with the consequences and the longer it takes to hit home the worse it is when it does That is one thing, uh, I was just discussing this in the chat box, and there, there will be a replay, I think, if people watch this after the fact. Um, on Twitter, I and also on Quora, I have this marvelous thing that happens where really, really big, highfalutin, lefty accounts with thousands of and thousands and thousands of followers block me, even when I'm a really small account. Um, and I've also had times where this happens or something analogous happens in person. You know, I, uh, I'm talking to a progressive in person and they start bringing up the social justice stuff and then they just stop. I'm just looking at them and they just stop. And my theory is, is that there's something about me that just gives away what kind of a person I am. And it has the effect of a libtard suppression field that they just close their mouths when I'm around or they leave. I guess they see that you're not accepting any of it. <laughs> you need a scoreboard behind you. This is quite a collection of scalps. Oh, yeah, I'm also blocked on Quora by that Fei Fei Wang chick. She's a Chinese nationalist who is totally okay with any horrifying atrocities the CCP commits, but she always brings up the racism stuff because she knows Americans will listen to it. Uh, so that's something that the Chinese use as a rhetorical tool. <laughs> Which is crazy because some of the stuff that I've seen come out of China is incredibly racist. Like, insanely so. And I'm like, these are the people you want to, like, partner with? It's just because they're a superpower and they're, and they're socialist, communist, whatever you want to fucking call it. Um, but only because they're willing to uh, essentially crush their citizens to... Um, not allow them to have anything for themselves. It's like, they they still are, like, making money hand over fist. There's so many uh, Chinese billionaires out there. So it's like, what do you... I, I don't understand... I, I guess it all feels very hypocritical and maybe just willfully ignorant to me to ignore so much of this information and go, that's our friend. And, and it's like, your friend is a serial rapist or whatever <laughs> like and they have no problem with it <laughs> um and that's one thing that i uh, how to say this
<laughs> uh, Hippocratic Oaf says, it's your beard. Um, awful white female liberals. Is that what that stands for? Awful white female liberals automatically know, uh, automatically know I'm trouble. Curse this face diaper. <laughs> no, uh, but, but yes, yeah, so um, while, while I do project an extremely powerful libtard suppression field, and this is something that, that has occurred to me, because I have friends who do similar stuff to what I do, and they get way worse blowback for it. Um, you've been banned from Twitter. I have a friend who got a strike on YouTube for saying, uh, I, I got a, I had a friend who got a strike on YouTube for nothing, basically. And I've had, I've seen people get banned on Quora. I've seen people get the hammer on social media so many times and in person, you know, get harassed, have people start arguments with them, all this stuff. And it doesn't seem to happen to me. And I'm not bragging. People think I'm bragging when I say this. It, I, I'm mystified by it. It's like I, it's the libtard suppression field. It's like Teflon. But affluent white female liberal. There we go. But I think I know what causes it. I think I know what causes it. And that's that whatever it is about me, most conservatives, I think, when the left sees them, they see someone who has to be attacked or suppressed. There's something about me, however, that is so repugnant to them that they would rather just not see me. So I'm so, there's something about me that is just so mind-bogglingly horrible to them that they would rather just pretend I'm not there. And I don't know what it is. I, I conjecture that there are plenty of intelligent conservatives, including ones that are much smarter than me. But the problem is, is that I have the kind of education that the left actually values. I have a strong background in humanities. I can have a very long and involved conversation about Heidegger, Kant, and Nietzsche, and the general evolution and development of German idealism. Um, I can talk about how Nietzsche broke with Schopenhauer and what that meant. And I can, you know, I, I, I even have a certain amount of familiarity with the post-structuralists, with Foucault and Deleuze and Derrida and Baudrillard and so on. And what I think it is, is the idea of someone with that sort of background being conservative causes such cognitive dissonance that the doors just slam shut and they pretend I'm not there. I could see that. You know, it was funny. I saw something recently. I think it was a study out of John Hopkins. He said vaccine hesitancy is, high, is highest in people with PhDs. And it's lowest with people with master's degrees, which is what I have. And the second highest hesitancy group is those uh, with high school. And I thought that was really interesting. And I, I guess I'm an outlier in that. <laughs> that I, <laughs> But um, because that your level of education and there was a tipping point where you were more educated and less likely to follow this bullshit. And and I thought that was pretty interesting. It's one thing that has occurred to me is that, you know, I am middle class and I come from the middle class. So I say this as someone who comes from that background, but the middle class is fucking insufferable. Um, and I have a theory on why that is. So let me lay it out for you. Middle class people are unique in that they that professionally they depend on their reputations. Middle class people are in an economic position where reputation is very important. Not so with the working class. If you're a plumber and you're the only plumber in the area, it doesn't matter if you have a Confederate flag or a MAGA hat on your pickup truck. If people need their faucet replaced, they're going to call you because you're the only one who can do that. Um, if you work in a factory, nobody cares what you think. Uh, if you drive a semi-truck, nobody cares what you think. You're just salt of the earth. So you don't really have to care about other people's opinions. I mean, yeah, nobody gives a shit. But on the other hand, cool, nobody gives a shit. I can say whatever I want. So they're not so concerned with how they appear to other people. And you can see this in, if you've ever worked at a blue-collar job 
one of my one of my favorite things about those kinds of jobs was I didn't have to pretend to like people. If I didn't like somebody, I could make it really obvious I didn't want to talk to them, and they would fuck off. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the upper class and also people with uh, um, who are independently wealthy because they're economically secure. They also don't have to give a shit what anyone thinks. The middle class has kind of a problem, though, which is that if you want to be a lawyer, you've got to have a good reputation. A doctor has to have a good reputation. An engineer has to have the right resume. You know, if you're a software dev, you've got to have people who can vouch for you to get the next coding job. Reputation is important to people who are middle class. And that affects the culture of the middle class. It's not just that it's important to them for professional reasons. It's also important to them in general. Uh, why are HOAs so insufferable? Why is it that you can have your trash can in the same place by your house for 10 years and suddenly the HOA decides they need to build a fence around it because some fucking AW, some affluent uh, white female liberal called into the HOA and complained? Well, why is, why is that? Well, HOAs are all about appearances. They're all about keeping up appearances. They're all about things that reflect well on our community. It's reputation because that's important to the middle class. Um, and, and, you know, why is it that people who grow up middle class sometimes uh, end up hating the middle class? Now, um, disclaimer, this isn't me. One of my parents was middle class. The other was working class. We grew up kind of middle, lower middle. We didn't have a ton of money. Um, and more to the point, our, the culture, because we were very religious and also um, not super wealthy, we had kind of like a... I, I wasn't exposed to some of the niceties of upper middle class culture, and I'm kind of grateful for it. But anyway, one thing you'll notice is that people who grew up that way sometimes resent it because they're basically raised to be employees. Uh, upper middle class people have this thing where they basically raise their kids in such a way as to prepare them for a white collar employment, and that's the only thing they care about. Um, I started, my childhood started working class and moved up to middle class, I would say. I ended up in the suburbs, which, to be fair, my parents did it because I had a learning disability and the schools were better. Uh, so that decision was mostly because of me. And the, but, and I am a white collar worker and everything. <laughs> and uh, I'm college educated and I don't like hanging out with what I call yuppies. <laughs> I don't want to live in the suburbs. I don't want to be around the kind of people who are so obsessed with how they are perceived by others because I find it childish. Uh, it's like, are you still a teenager? Because you have no excuse. <laughs> and they want to draw you into these little games they play and, and you just go like, I can't. <laughs> I know, I don't play those kind of games. Like, I recognize them. Like, purely, I, I, I absolutely do recognize them when they happen, and I just, I don't engage in them. And it's like, I'm like skating within the middle class and hating everyone around me. <laughs> I don't care about the same things. <laughs> Hippocratic Oaf says the bourgeois are risk averse. I had a French boss that agreed with me, one of my ideas, and asked me to argue my point. Our boring programming meeting got exciting. The French argue but leave as friends. I mean, and part of it has to do, I think, with Calvinism. Uh, because American culture is deeply influenced by Calvinism, and in Calvinist Christianity, one of the things that happens is this idea that if you're rich, it means God likes you, and if you're poor, it means God doesn't like you, and you had better show that you are morally upright and have decent money, or else you might just be a backsliding outcast reprobate. And that culture, that whole attitude, it still exists among the American upper middle class, even though they're mostly secular now, but it just takes the form of, you know, left-wing political activism. I forget who it was, but someone once made the uh, observation that American liberalism is basically the pursuit of Protestantism by other means, and that, that is true. 
uh, there was a time when in the Northeast, this isn't Calvinism, this is actually a form of Anglicanism, but there was a time where in the Northeast in New England, being Episcopalian was sort of a shibboleth for being upper middle class and being decent. Um, and now that's being replaced with the woke stuff. But it's the same thing. It plays the same role that Episcopalianism did. I say it's actually more, um, like, dangerous because of the fact that it isn't religious. Because you can get people to say that they still follow their own religion, whatever it is, or no religion at all, and they can still do this. And, um, versus if it was actually a belief system in another deity, you couldn't easily convert people to it. Um, so c converting people in religion is hard. Converting people people into secular ideology is easy by comparison, especially if you tell them they're a good person if they do it. <laughs> and this is one thing that happens very easily with people who are liberal about their religion. Uh, one minor caveat, though, there is a lot of conflict between uh, sort of woke ideology and conservative religious people, not just Christians. Uh, in the UK, a lot of woke stuff has ended up getting booted out of primary education because Muslim parents threw a fit. And that's actually pretty common. Muslim parents in the UK have ended up uh, getting a lot of this woke stuff um, thrown out of primary level education because they find out what's going on, you know, you that you have drag queen story hour or whatever, and they go ape shit, and then it stops happening. Um, so, and I think that part of the reason that wokeism conflicts with conservative uh, iterations of various religions, Christianity, Islam, and so on, and even Judaism, you know, Orthodox Jews voted for Trump uh, by a higher percentage than any other population in the country, which is kind of interesting. Um, other Jews did not, you know, like Reform Jews obviously were much more liberal, but the Orthodox Jews were very heavy Trump voters. Anyway, um, what was I saying? So I think part of the reason that it conflicts with other religions is not just because it conflicts with their various tenets regarding uh, premarital sex or, or gender or whatever, but also because it's just plain old-fashioned one religion butting up against another. That's just what's happening. <coughs> well, and what I find funny about that is that I'm pretty sure that it creates this, uh, if the Muslims stand against this, that it creates this, like, sort of conflict within the, the authority that has to make that decision. Like, I was told to value these people's, you know, standings and, you know, high, on a high, uh, higher on the hierarchy, so, um, but they're being against the ideology, and so <laughs> it's like they have a, um, a moment of, a uh, crisis over which one they go with. <laughs> uh, Targa7w says, there are some super prod holdouts on the islands here in Scotland. Uh, he says, no dancing and domestic violence all the rage. Oh, oh, really? So when Sean Connery, that interview I saw where he talks about how it's okay to slap women in the face, that wasn't just him being an old man? Like, that's just him being from a certain island in Scotland? <laughs> Maybe. Well, and that was the thing, too, is that um, we talk about this sometimes, that cultural relativism is used to excuse behaviors. And that's the thing, though, is that I, I won't adhere to cultural relativism and I won't adhere to moral absolutism because I find them they're both too extreme for me. I want somewhere in, like, maybe closer to moral absolution. Absolutely, but not um, fully that, because I feel like if people don't have the tools to know that something is wrong, then you need to account for that. Um, but uh, there, it, there does come a certain point where it's like, no, it's obvious slavery is wrong. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, Targa says Sean's an Edinburgh boy. Oh, I, I had no idea. I thought Sean Connery was from out in the boonies. I didn't realize he was from a big city. Okay, okay so that just was him being an old man. Okay. Um, let me see here. I'm going to post this Hayek quote 
from uh, from a conflict of visions onto uh, Twitter because I think it's awesome. The rationalist whose reason is not sufficient to teach him those limitations of the power of conscious reason and who despises all the institutions and customs which have not been consciously designed would thus become the destroyer of the civilization built upon them. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a more pithy way to say it. Maybe something like there's nothing more dangerous than a rationalist whose reason is not sufficient to see the limitations of reason. That is incredibly frustrating about the unconstrained vision is that it, it is its rejection of all of the past of law, of reason, of morality, any kind of contribution to, you know, human society over the years. Which is one of the reasons why they keep trying to erase the past. Not only so that they can control the present, uh, at, to quote to paraphrase Orwell, but also because they don't see its value. Right. And it's, it's almost like the Dunning-Kruger effect as a religion. <laughs> Hmm. By the way, I think your mic, even though you keep tapping it, uh, I don't think that's what's capturing audio for the meeting. How's this sound now? Uh, fine. Uh, fine. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Really? So why is it... I have it set up to capture from this thing. I think it's capture must be capturing from my webcam instead because it's like completely stupid um use the microphone yeah well i don't know what the deal is all right so anyhow um, going, going back to the text, and thanks for alerting me to the problem with the mic. Uh, <clears throat> going back to the text, I think that, let's see what it says here. The clash over judicial activism reflects a much more general clash over the best way to contribute to the social good. In the unconstrained vision, wise and conscientious individuals should strive to shape the best outcomes in particular issues that come within their jurisdiction. In the constrained vision, the inherent limitations of individuals mean that each individual's best con contribution to society is to adhere to the special duties of his institutional role and let systemic process determine outcomes. By contrast, the unconstrained vision was exemplified in Chief Justice Earl Warren's interruption of lawyers unfolding complex legal principles to ask, but is it right? Is it good? In the constrained vision, that was neither his business nor within his competence. But the specialist's superiority exists only within a narrow range of skills, in this instance determining how the written law applied to the case at hand. Burke said, I revere men in the functions which belong to them, but not beyond. Earl Warren shouldn't Earl have been a judge. He should have been a legislator, an elected official. I mean, judges here in Arizona are elected, but you're not supposed to make law from the bench. So I think he should have been a legislator. Because it, it means the law is what it is when you're in the courtroom. That's not what it's designed for to, you know, change the laws. That's not what it's there for. It's to enforce the laws. And I I have a really hard time with that um state that idea from uh the unconstrained vision people because it's like just if you want to change things go into legislation don't go into the ju the courtroom <laughs> because then here's the problem with it it's chaotic it's say you're accused of breaking a law and you go into the courtroom 
and then they decide to change the rules on you while you're in the courtroom. You know, and suddenly you you you're under much uh higher levels of uh judicial stress because you may end up going to prison for ten years instead of just five because they've decided that oh this was uh this law is not actually tough enough, you know I just I don't think that's uh smart to change the laws in the courtroom once an act has already happened. It's like if you're upset over how uh the court is you know enacting law then you should go to the legislator and ask them to make changes because for the future you, you this is post hoc law changing and i just i'm not okay with it Yeah. Oh, geez, what do we have? Uh, Hippocratic Oak says, did we take a wrong turn by taking Charles the first head? Do we need to roll back the Enlightenment? I mean, to be honest, if you look at what Thomas Sowell is saying, it's basically pre-modernism. He's basically expounding philosophies that are pre-Enlightenment. Here's the interesting thing. If you look closely at what he's saying, it's not that different from post-modernism. Postmodern philosophy, in terms of a lot of the criticisms it makes, are really similar to the stuff Sowell is saying, which I think is really funny. But that's because pre-modernism and post-modernism are just two different varieties of anti-modernism. And at the root, they're both a rejection of modernity, so they're ultimately not that far apart. They just have different values. I would say that... Um... The problem with the unconstrained vision doesn't come when um, you're thinking about the perfectibility of man or any of that stuff, so much as it is when it gets proscriptive, when it asks you to start doing things um, in the name of some higher good. Because uh, it, it can, some of its ideas are okay, like the idea that you should value uh, knowledge made by, um, uh, you know, the scientific reasoning or whatever, but it's when it goes no value whatsoever for anything of the past, where it's like, oh, okay, wait a minute, hold on. Like, first of all, our, our, our knowledge is absolutely foundational. Like, we build upon it over time, especially in the science fields. Like, you're not going to have a lot of the... You're not going to space if you don't have Newton, essentially. <laughs> it's like... And that's a big part of the problem to me, is that it's like... You start spreading that idea that past the past doesn't matter is when you're uh, going to, first of all, repeat uh, problems of the past and destroy things. Um, which is why you posted that quote to tw Twitter, because it is absolutely true. You destroy things when you ignore the past. All right. No, I, I, I think that also, I remember seeing, I, I, I've argued with people who have said things like, well, of course, movies from before 1960 or so should have a warning label on them. Have you seen what's in those movies? The implication being that because movies from before 1960 or so are not woke propaganda, that means they're bad. Um, or that they're Nazi or racist or whatever the answer is. And... And you, and you can also see this in a lot of the destruction of statues that went on in 2020. Uh, there was a statue of Robert the Bruce in the UK that had was a racist spray painted on it. Now, Robert the Bruce lived in Scotland in, I think, like the 1400s or somewhere around there and probably never saw a person who was not uh, whose ethnicity was from outside of Great Britain. Well, no, he might have seen an Irish person. 
perhaps for a French person, but he probably never met anyone who wasn't European. Uh, how was he racist being some parochial Scottish guy in the 1400s? Who knows? But it was an old statue, so it must be racist. And this is kind of how leftists think, um, is that anything that is old or organic or traditional is automatically under suspicion of being somehow bigoted or bad and should be gotten rid of. Well, even sometimes they're going after something that actually changed things for the positive, like a representation of a what they call a marginalized group that actually helped change things for that group after it came out, like a movie or a TV show or whatever. And then they and they go, but it's it's, you know, it's old, so it must be bad. They must be doing something bad with it. And it's like, have you even seen it? Have you researched it? You Because honestly, like a law came out of there that helped, you know, against discrimination or something. And they're just, they're just like, whatever, it's in the past. It has to be bad. And it's really frustrating when you, especially as I get older and I've seen more and more things that even when I was a kid had a positive impact on um, one of those groups and them going, this is bad. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to do with it. Well, let's return back to the text. Let's see here. Just as the unconstrained vision urges judicial activism on judges, it urges social responsibility upon businessmen, that they should hire, invest, donate, and otherwise conduct their businesses with an eye to producing specific benefits to society at large. The socially responsible businessman should, for example, hire the disadvantage, invest in things that seem most needed by society rather than those most profitable to his firm, and turn part of the proceeds over to charitable and cultural activities rather than pay all the proceeds out to the stockholders or plow them back into the business. The constrained vision sees such things as outside the competence of businessmen, given the wider ramifications of such decisions in a complex systemic process. According to the constrained vision of human knowledge, what is within the businessman's competence is the running of his particular firm so as to promote its prosperity within the law. It is the systemic effect of competition rather than the individual intentions of businessmen which this vision relies on to produce social benefit. According to Adam Smith, it is when the businessman intends only his own gain that he contributes via the process of competition to promote the social good more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. Smith added, I have never known much good done by those who affected the trade for the public good. And, I mean, it, it is true. Uh, it, it is true. Um, in response to, well, I'll, I'll respond in the chat to that. Uh, what, what do you have to say to that, Alex? Do you have an immediate comment to that? So, to some extent, I think um, that's true, but it also can be narrow because people have many sides to themselves. Um, so they can... A businessman can also be something else at the same time. Not necessarily like a social justice warrior, that's not my point. But, you know, he could be very much into, you know... Uh, basketball, so he maybe he coaches a little, uh, you know, a, a kids team uh, on the weekends or something like that. You know, like I, I feel like it, it might be a little too narrow about your role in society, but for the most part, like if you have, a, you know, um, uh, the ability to do something at a at a at an adequate level, you should probably be focusing on it. It's just, I feel like some people wear many hats. I, I, I say that and then immediately thought of my YouTube name, Alex Valtrace. Indeed. And, you know, there is a place for generalists and for roundly educated people, and this is part of the value of a liberal education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, universities, Greek statues. Um, 
That being said, there's a, sort of like Steven Pinker said, no Mandarin is wise enough to guide the evolution of the species. There's no such thing as somebody who is so smart that they can remake society in their own image. Now, there are a whole lot of... Uh, there are a whole lot of... Um, tech nerds in, in Silicon Valley who probably think they have the right to make society in their own image. Certainly with the, you know, with the way that such companies act, with Apple trying to institute, uh, basically trying to perform law enforcement on behalf of the government by scanning people's private images. Uh, and you know, they justify it by saying they're looking for uh, kitty porn, but the truth is, is that it's going to expand from that to any to hate hate speech and everything else, of course it's going to. That's the whole point. That's why they're doing it. It's consciously intended. That's not a slippery slope argument, by the way, although, first of all, the slippery slope is not a fallacy, but even if it were, that's still not a slippery slope argument because I'm saying that they consciously intend that and are just not saying it out loud. I'd agree to that, uh, that the, that is their end game. I, that's what that's what they're setting out to do from the very start. And even if you don't believe that, you should understand that it, it's an invasion of privacy no matter what. And in principle, you should stand against it. Especially when uh, there was that shooting in California several years back and Apple refused to unlock the um, iPhone that the shooter had, even though the, the phone was technically owned by the county, and they refused to help them. And it's like, I, I, you're being pretty choosy on when you think that uh, you should be helping the state. <laughs> One second. Uh, because of conflicting visions of how much knowledge a given individual can have and how effective that knowledge can be in deciding complex social issues, the two visions attach widely differing importance to sincerity and fidelity. Where the wise and conscientious individual is conceived to be competent to shape socially beneficial outcomes directly, then his sincerity and dedication to the common good are crucial. Godwin's whole purpose was to strengthen the individual's sincerity fortitude, and justice. The importance of general sincerity was a recurring theme in Godwin, and has remained so over the centuries, among others with the unconstrained vision. Sincerity tends to liberate. Whenever I hear the word liberate, I reach for a knife. No, just kidding. Uh, according to Godwin, and to bring every other virtue in its train. While conceding that everyone is insincere at some time or other, Godwin nevertheless urged a general and unalterable sincerity as a powerful ideal, capable of producing profound social ben benefits. Sincerity holds no such place of honor in the constrained vision. Those with this vision often readily concede sincerity to their adversaries, treating it as an individual virtue of minor social benefit and sometimes as a major aggravating factor when people persist in socially counterproductive ideals. What is morally central to the constrained vision is fidelity to duty in one's role in life. There, within the sphere of his competence, the individual can make the greatest contribution to the social good by serving the great systemic process which decides the actual outcomes. This is an entirely different conception of duty from that of the unconstrained vision, where one's duty is direct beneficence to mankind. But in the constrained vision, the individual wielding social decision-making power lacks the competence to continually make ad hoc determinations of what specifically is good for mankind, however sincere he may be. This is one place where I do break with Sowell. I kind of disagree with him a bit. Uh, he says that people with the constrained vision will concede sincerity to their adversaries. Now, my vision is probably more constrained than most people you're going to find on YouTube. Uh, I have one of the most, of all of like the 
highfalutin, wiggly eyebrow philosophy channels, I'm probably the most conservative one. That being said, I don't concede sincerity to my adversaries. I think they're full of shit. I also think that they lie to themselves. Uh, one, one big example of that, and I have to go on a rant about this, is the use of the word empathy, or rather the abuse of the word empathy. Um, you know, saying I feel empathy for X group of people right off the bat is a lie. It's always a lie. And if you don't believe me, I can prove to you that abstract empathy doesn't exist. You can have concrete empathy toward a family member or a friend or someone right in front of you, or even to a fictional character if you feel that you know them. Empathy for fictional characters is a real thing. People cry over movies and stuff. But you can't have empathy for an abstract group of people. It just doesn't exist. And I'll prove that to you. Every second, 1.8 human beings dies on average. In the past five seconds that I have been speaking, nine people have probably died. Do you care? Okay, there went, there went nine more. You still don't give a shit. They're dropping like flies out there. You don't give a fuck. And some people will come back with, oh, well, that's a hypothetical. So that isn't real. So that doesn't prove anything. Okay, fine. Go to obituaries.com and type in your hometown. That will give you a list of real people who have died in your hometown. And what will happen is you will read that list. You'll read the list of names and you will feel nothing. And that proves me right. Abstract empathy is not real. And, you know, they'll, they will kick and scream over this. If you, if you point this out to a progressive in person and really ram the point down their throat, they will choke on it. They will kick and scream and go into an existential crisis in this spiral of cognitive dissonance because they can't cope with the fact that this, this abstract empathy, which a huge part of their identity is founded on, is baloney. It's, it, it's absolute horse shit. There is no such thing as abstract empathy, and deep down they know it, and if you try to pull that out of them, they will, they, they will go absolutely apeshit. They will go berserk because a big part of their identity rests on this absurd, pompous, messianic pretense that is, that, that is, just, that, that is just absurd. I know I said it was absurd twice. That was redundant. Forgive me, gods of grammar. Well, the thing to me is, is that I mean, it's funny that you should mention empathy. And I, it's something I started years ago and I never got back to it. Um, I have a blog called The Empathetic Writer um, because empathy is a huge part of the process of writing fiction. You have to create people and then empathize with them to, in order to make them real. And I was thinking about that process as you were talking, and I don't think... See, I can uh, conceptualize people I uh, think that, you know... Oh God, this is even hard to explain, but uh, basically, by starting from abstract bullshit empathy and using the force of imagination which most people don't have a very strong imagination, you can actually feel empathy for people you've never met, including fake people. But the problem is most people do not have that skill. So the empathy that they're experiencing is false, and it's a, it's a signal that I'm a good person. Because they allow so many horrible things to go through. Because if it was real empathy, they would have a problem with some of the stuff. I had this big long thread on um, Twitter before I got banned about um, how Black Lives Matter, and um, <laughs> and that, and that sounds like a, a liberal virtue signal. But I was talking about burned down businesses and homes and stuff like that, and partially because I had read some of these people's accounts, and um, and I'm like. Fake, absurdist empathy doesn't recognize other kinds of pain. Only this very specific, very uh, packaged group of people 
that is idealized for the ideology. So that's part of how it's so bad is that it allows all this other shit to get through that's really awful and terrible and they don't care about it. Yeah, somebody in the chat says, I would love to see Caleb in a corporate race sensitivity training class. I avoided it by being a contractor, but I heard it was ridiculous. Oh, geez. You see, <laughs> I would get fired so fast. It'd be hilarious, though, because I wouldn't just tell them they're wrong. You know, I, I would draw them into a discussion and tr make them face the absurdity of their deeply held beliefs until they crack and have a meltdown and an existential crisis over it. And that would get me fired, of course, but would also be hilarious. I've got, I have to go through corporate racial and gender sensitivity training every year. But the nice thing about it is that my my company is conservative. So they just use classical liberal training. They've used the same one for the whole time I've been there. <laughs> and it, so it's not like I'm not offended by it's bullshit because it's not bullshit. It's like one of the instant, a couple of the instances, it's uh, sexism and the victim is a man and the perpetrators are women. So I'm like, see, I can handle this. <laughs> Because it's not ideology at that point, They're, because they recognize um, the ability of uh, anyone to be victim or perpetrator. I don't know how well I would handle it if it was ideology-based. <laughs> so, well, I mean, it's, it, it's all... Being basically forced to believe things that are not true is... yeah. To return to the text, sincerity is so central to the unconstrained vision that it is not readily conceded to adversaries, who are often depicted as apologists, if not venal. It is not uncommon in this tradition to find references to their adversaries' real reasons, which must be unmasked. Um... This is... and, and this is one thing that I think is kind of interesting, again, because I, in that sense, I'm more like one of the unconstrained people. I tend to see my opponents as being liars or as being false or at the very, at best, self-deluding and, and pointing out that they're full of shit and lying to themselves for the sake of status is one of my favorite things to do. Now, I think this might actually not be rooted in my temperament. It's not because I'm unconstrained. It's because since sincerity is so important to them, and I noticed that it seems to upset them more, that made me want to do it. <laughs> so maybe it's just me being a constrained troll, I guess. It sounds trolly. <laughs> Trollish. <laughs> but, um, I, I have a, uh, god. The problem with their sincerity is that it's so manufactured, and I mean that in the literal sense, like the idea that someone gave them a product and that product is a group of words they need to say, <laughs> and and they just fling those out there whenever they they need to seem like a good person. <laughs> And it's, it's funny you should say that, they, because to them this is all just a game of saying the right words. And it's funny because when they try to act like a conservative person, they get it so terribly wrong because they think it's about using the right words. They think that it's about saying a certain set of passwords or something. It's weird. They have this weird idea that... that that, that, that being a good person, by whatever definition that is, is about talking a certain way. Yeah, they do that to any political opponents. I've seen them do that to centrists, too. Uh, they, I mean, that's why they build so many straw men, because they, it's like they've made up a person. But to the idea, as you said, that this is how they would speak, and as opposed to act. And that's um, really weird. Uh, to, I don't understand, I guess I'm, as much as I am a writer, I really don't understand how people can consider in interpersonal relationships and in society at large how important words are. They're not that important. Yes, 
It's true. Um, oh, geez. Uh, Target7W says pro progressives, SJWs, whatever you want to call them, are the enemy. They neither need nor deserve any consideration beyond that. Now, I think it's worthwhile to try to understand them if only to know how to defeat them, but there is a certain Patton quote, a quote by George S. Patton about Russians that I'm not going to say out loud that may apply here. Um, now I have to go look it up. <laughs> don't say it out loud, but you know. Not that I'm going to say which quote it is, of course. He said lots of things about Russians. Uh... Related to the question of sincerity versus fidelity is the issue of roles or structured relationships. Well, actually, you know what? We we are we are at an hour and fifteen. I think maybe I should call it here. Uh, Alex, do you have a closing statement? Uh, yeah, I felt like this was clearer than the last chapter on what his point was, and I and it's ap the application of the two types of visions in law and uh, society. I felt like it was this was more solid chapter. All right. Uh, I thought that this was, this is my favorite chapter so far because it just shows that both sides can talk, will talk past one another because they both have different ideas about how reasoning works. So I, I think that that's definitely a worthwhile observation to take on board. Uh, anyway, that's uh, 